Welcome to our online service from Hill Street. It's great that you're able to join us today wherever you're joining us from. As you can see, the church is decorated for Christmas and we're looking forward next week to being able to welcome people back into the building uh, to worship together. Let me say just a word about what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. We want everybody in the congregation to have the opportunity to come to a carol service between now and Christmas. We uh, always really enjoy the carol services that we have here each year. It won't be the same, of course, as normal. We normally pack everybody in. We're not able to do that. But we will be able to come together in five different groupings uh, over the coming weeks. And hopefully everybody who wants to be able to come to a carol service between now and Christmas will have the opportunity to do so. So we'll be having services morning and evening on Sunday the 13th and the 20th of December, and then one on the Monday evening uh, of the 21st of December. And your elder will be in touch to let you know uh, what the service is for uh, your district. We do look forward to coming together to celebrate the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government there will be no end. We thank God for the gift of his Son, and we worship God together today.
As we continue in worship today, we're going to come now and pray together. It's our time to adore God and to confess our sin. So let's come together in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come into your presence today, welcomed by you, brought into your presence by the, your rescuing work, Jesus, when you went to the cross. Father, we approach you today dressed in the perfect clothes of Christ. We approach you as your children. You have loved us from before the world began, your covenant of redemption, the eternal agreement between you, Father, and your Son to save a people chosen in Christ before the ages began. So great is your love for us that there is nothing that we have done to merit it. You have simply poured out your provision for us. We were heading towards the grave. The disease of sin had riddled us. But God, you sent your only Son. And Jesus, you came to cure us, to rescue and to redeem us. And this cure required you to descend from heaven and to become a man, to live the perfect life, to endure the punishment we deserve. The one who is the author of life had to experience death so that we might live. The Son of God, led in a tomb in Jerusalem. It seemed like death had overcome. It appeared like darkness had swallowed our King. But the story was not over. Jesus, you could not be held. Jesus, you could not be contained. And you rose victorious, leading captives in your wake. The world could not overcome you. The darkness could not vanquish the light. Your glory could not be confined. And for all who believe, you have given the right to become children of God. Today we confess that the magnitude of what you have done for us does not register with us. We are slow to grasp how much danger we were in. Our hearts are slow to respond in praise. Our mouths are reluctant to worship. Our minds are bent towards selfish living rather than serving you in your kingdom. Forgive us today. Swap our sinful hearts for hearts that love you dearly. Forgive us for holding back for lacking enthusiasm, for apathy, for lethargy. May we be committed disciples, full of joy and love, delighting in you, treasuring you, different people than those of the world. We ask today that we would be blown away by who you are, that we would see you, that we would adore you, that we would find you our first love. Help us in these things, we pray. For we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Today we continue our series in John, and Nigel's going to come and preach in just a little while for us. We're in John 17 today, so if you have your Bible, please do open it with me. John chapter 17, and we're going to begin to read at verse 20. So John 17 and verse 20. This is a passage uh, known as the, the Lord's High Priestly Prayer for us. This is Jesus' uh, prayer for us. And we come to it here in verse 20. 17 and verse 20. This is God's word to us. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Not all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those who you have given to me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. 
I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Amen. We thank God for his word to us. I'm going to ask Shelley now to continue our series from beginning to everlasting. Do you like to receive messages? You might receive a message on the telephone. You can receive text messages and emails. A very long time ago, some people also used to use pigeons to deliver messages. My favorite type of message to receive is a letter in the post. Now, I don't mean one of those letters that sometimes come in brown envelopes because usually those are bills. But I love to receive letters in the post from friends who have a message for me. I've got a message with me today. Would you like to see what's inside? It looks pretty important, but I'm afraid we're going to have to wait a little bit longer. The end of our last episode was very, very sad. God's people were taken away from the beautiful land that God had given them. They were taken to a faraway land called Babylon. But even though they were far from home, God still spoke to them. He didn't speak to them on the telephone or by text message or by email or even by letter. He sent special messengers called prophets to bring special messages to his people. One of the messengers was called Ezekiel. Let's see what message God gave the people through Ezekiel. The message says God will raise up the temple again and give his people clean hearts. The beautiful temple had been destroyed, but God promised that one day it would be raised up again and he would give his people clean hearts. Another prophet was called Isaiah. Let's see what message Isaiah brought to the people. Wow. Through Isaiah, God reminded the people that his forever king would come from King David's family. And there was another prophet called Jeremiah. Let's see what message Jeremiah brought to the people. Jeremiah told the people that Israel, the people of Israel, God's people, would return home in 70 years. God's people were going home again, but they were going to have to wait. These messages from the prophets were all written down in God's special book. We can read these messages for ourselves in the Bible. When God's people were in Babylon, there was a man named Daniel. You may have heard about Daniel because there are lots and lots of stories in the Bible about him. There were many times in Daniel's life when he could have said, I give up. I'm not following God anymore. It's just too difficult. But Daniel followed God, even when it seemed like nobody else was following God. Because Daniel knew that God was with him and that God would never, ever leave him. Daniel made God number one in his life. Daniel talked to God many, many times each day. And when he was told that he had to stop, that he shouldn't talk to God anymore, he didn't listen because God was number one in his life. And Daniel knew that God hears and answers the prayers of his children. Daniel was thrown into a den of lions. Now, I don't mean soft, cuddly lions like this guy. I mean big scary lions with big scary teeth and hungry tummies. Do you think God left Daniel? No, God was right there with Daniel and God closed the mouths of the lions and kept Daniel safe. Wow, God is amazing. Nothing is impossible for him. God's special messenger, Jeremiah, had told the people that God promised that after 70 years they would return home again. And when 70 years had passed, 
Daniel prayed and asked God to remember his promise. Do you think God kept his promise? Yes. The people of Israel returned home to Jerusalem. They celebrated. They said, God is good. His love never ends. It lasts forever. They rebuilt the temple just as God said would happen. But the people were still waiting. What were they waiting for? They were waiting for God's forever king to come to rescue his people from sin forever. Then something unusual happened. Or maybe I should say nothing happened because there were no more messages from God. Nothing. Not for one day or one month or one year or 10 years or 100 years, but 400 years, 400 years of silence. Other nations got bigger and bigger and bigger. The kings from other nations ruled over God's people. What on earth was going on? Now, I told you that I had a message that I was going to show you. Let's see where that message is. Do you think we should have a look and see what's going on? Now, I'll untie my ribbon. Hmm. This is an unusual message. It says, everyone is to go to his hometown to be counted. Signed, Caesar Augustus. Hmm. Caesar Augustus was a very, very important ruler, but he wanted everyone to know how important he was. And he thought he would do this by counting all of the people. But he didn't know that someone far greater was coming. God's forever king was on his way. Come back next week to find out what happens next. Jesus
If you have a Bible handy, you might find it useful to turn with me to John 17, those verses that we read earlier. Many years ago now, I found myself in the home of an older man who was a believer attached to a different congregation. And we chatted for a while, and towards the end of my time there, I asked if he would mind if I prayed with him. And he said that was okay, and I prayed with him. And when I looked up, it was clear that he had been crying and, and I thought that perhaps something I had said had uh, annoyed him in some way. But he said, no, it's, it's just that no one has ever prayed for me before. Well, I was quite surprised. And if I had that call to do over again, I would have told him something that I think is really wonderful. That whether or not anybody that he remembers had actually prayed with him. 2,000 years earlier, Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples and he looked down through the years of history and he prayed for all who would believe. And so even if no one else had prayed for my friend, Jesus had prayed for him and for me. And for you too, if you're a believer today. And we're going to look at that prayer for a little time together today. Over these last weeks, we've been in John's gospel. We've been looking at the teaching that Jesus gave to his disciples in the upper room on the eve of the crucifixion. And that teaching ends with Jesus praying. It takes up all of chapter 17. If you have an NIV, you'll see that it breaks it into uh, three sections that correspond with the main focuses of Jesus' prayer uh, in those verses. So in verses 1 to 5, he prays about his relationship with the Father and the Father's purposes in him. Uh, in verses 6 to 19, he prays for the disciples who are gathered around him. And uh, that touches on many of the themes that he had already taught them on, on their mission to a hostile world, a world that they are in and not off. And he prays for their protection and for their holiness, for their joy. And, and then in verses 20 to 26, the verses that we read, he looks ahead and he prays, as verse 20 says, for all who will believe. He prays for the coming people of God. It's really quite wonderful. He prays for us. And it's incredible to think that all those years ago, Jesus knew that the disciples' mission would produce fruit, that the good news would ring out across the world and down through the generations, and the church would be built. And Jesus prayed for all of those who would believe, and for you too, if you are a believer. You might know the uh, Guinness family, the, the Guinness fa of the brewery fame. Uh, they had a, a strong Christian influence and a strong Christian wing, and it led to a number of missionaries and Christian workers, and they've had a remarkable impact across the world. And much of that impact can be traced back, apparently, to an old Mrs. Guinness who, who prayed for, if I remember it correctly, eight generations of her descendants. And she didn't know them, of course, but she imagined 
them and prayed for them. So she prayed for her children, for her children's children, and then she imagined their children's children and so on and so on. And she prayed God's blessing upon them. And she did so regularly. Well, it's a remarkable story. But, but Jesus looks forward and he doesn't imagine his uh, spiritual offspring, as it were. He knows and he prays. One writer puts it like this, like a mountaineer gazing out from an eminence across the expanding vista as range succeeds range into the distant horizon, so Jesus gazes out across the rolling centuries. He beholds and embraces the harvest of the ages, the church of the redeemed, gathered from every nation, people, language, and tribe. He is praying for us. Now, often whenever we pray, we, we sort of reveal what we really think. And that's why sometimes it can be a little bit awkward to pray with others because they, we're sort of being vulnerable, as it were, in, in front of them. But Jesus prays out loud deliberately so that the disciples and we will know exactly what he thinks, so that we will find out what is of first importance to him. And when he looks ahead to all who will believe, there are certain things that are on his heart. There are more than we will look at perhaps here, but there are three that we want to pay particular attention to. So the first thing we can say is that Jesus wants his people to be united. He wants his people to be united. You, we see that here. So for example, verse 21, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. And then also in verse 23, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now, it might strike us as strange that Jesus would put such value in this. We, we might say, well, what of, of all the things we could ask for for the church would we ask for? We might say that the church needs more power or more protection or, or something like that. But Jesus prays for unity. You notice that Jesus compares the unity of believers to the unity that he shares with the Father. So if you think about the unity of the Son and the Father... It's not something that they have to work at. It's something that they have by virtue of who they are. Their unity naturally flows out and is experienced by them because they are actually one. And there's something of that in Christian unity. God has made believers one. It's not like we are a, a bunch of strangers that have nothing in common and, and God says, well, you, you just better get on together. Some people might describe that as union, but not as unity. Somebody has put it this way. If you take two weasels and you tie them together by the tail, you have union, but you probably don't have unity. Now, I'm not even sure where you get two weasels, and you shouldn't certainly tie them together by a tail. But, but I think that's uh, probably a good illustration. Christians, you see, are not just tied together. We're not into a forced union. We have been given unity. We share something deeply. God has made us one, and in particular, he has given us one Holy Spirit. And that's why you can meet a believer from the other side of the world, and you realize that there's something that you share that connects you to them in a remarkable way. It's as if you've known each other for, for much longer than you actually have. God has made us one, you see. On the other hand, Jesus speaks here of being brought to complete unity. So, so therefore, unlike he and his father, unity for disciples is also a process. It needs to be worked at. It, it, it may be better, it needs to be worked out. God has worked it into us, and we need to work it out. So we're constantly saying about our brothers and sisters, God has made us one. How can we show that? Now, of course, it's under attack when Jesus prays for unity back in verse 11 when he's thinking about the disciples. It's in the context of asking the Father to protect them. Jesus knows that the unity they have will be under pressure, it will be under attack. And indeed, that's what we see in the early church. The evil one attempts to destroy the church, sometimes by pressure from outside of the church, but sometimes also by internal division from within the church. So unity is a gift that we've been given, but it's also something that we have to work at and indeed something that's under attack. The unity of the church 
is precious to Jesus. Of all the things he could have asked for for us, he asks for this. Now, there are so many implications of this, many more than we have opportunity to go into now. It does say something about the church as a whole across the world, doesn't it? Which we see is split into all sorts of little subgroups, and we do that so easily. So at the very least, we need to learn, perhaps, to speak well of our brothers and sisters in other churches and denominations, and we need to work hard at our relationships with our brothers and sisters in other churches and denominations. It doesn't mean, of course, that we forget about questions of truth. Uh, Jesus speaks about those who will believe through their message as he thinks about the disciples, the apostles. So the, the church that Jesus wants to be unified is the church that is committed to and transformed by the apostolic message. That's really important. The truth as taught and defended by the apostles. So our, our unity is to be around that truth, that message. But perhaps the other place where this works out, maybe most easy to understand, is in the personal relationships that believers have with one another. Because we know how easily we find fault with our brothers and sisters. Not our brothers and sisters on the other side of the world that we don't know, but our brothers and sisters on the other side of the pew that we do know. We bear grudges. We dismiss those that we ought to draw near to. We see that these things actually matter to Jesus. So imagine that we have just heard Jesus pray these words, and then we see him go to the cross and we find ourselves somehow at odds with our brother or our sister. And with these words, you see, ringing in our ears, wouldn't we be a little less, a little more tolerant uh, of them? Wouldn't we be a little less tolerant of bitterness in our own hearts? Wouldn't we be saying, Lord, I, I know that you hate disunity amongst uh, the brothers and sisters, and, and so I, you know that there's this bitterness in my heart. Lord, will you help me to deal with it? With those words ringing in our ears, wouldn't we be quicker to forgive? Wouldn't we be more willing to go the extra mile, more willing to start again? Well, we don't have to imagine Jesus' words ringing in our ears. Hopefully, as we read them, they're ringing in our ears now. And so, we've got to remember that Jesus wants his people to be united. The second thing we see here that we want to highlight, at least, is that Jesus wants his people to be impactful. He wants us to make an impact. And where we make an impact is on the needy, lost world. You notice that Jesus assumes that his people are going to be on mission to the world. It's clear in what he has prayed for his disciples in the earlier verses. They're not a, off the world, but they are in the world. And Jesus leaves them in the world so that they will spread the good news and uh, be about spreading his great salvation. Uh, Jesus wants the world, therefore, to be one and persuaded. He shares the heart of God who so loved the world and gave his only one and only Son. And we see here that there are two elements that uh, that are part of the impact that his people are to make on the world. On the one hand, there's a message. So we see that in verse 20. People will come to believe through their message. The apostolic message is the gospel, which is necessary that people might be saved. And in our day and in our culture where people are very intolerant of evangelism and perhaps increasingly less tolerant of evangelism, it, it, it's helpful to be reminded that there is a message to be shared. People less tolerant, perhaps, of evangelism because it reminds them of the fact that there is such a thing as truth, that there is such a thing as a, a God to whom uh, they are accountable, with whom they must reckon. And, and we do need to remember that, that we have a, a message to share, even if it is an unwelcome message. But there's also another aspect to this impact that we're to have, and it is the witness of the church, of the body of believers, the, the community that results from those who respond to this message. And you notice here that it is the unity of that people, of uh, Christian people, the unity of the church that persuades. 
You see verse 23, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. In other places, it is love that is shared between believers. That's the hallmark of genuine transforming discipleship. And it's pretty much the same thing here. So how is this impact to be made? Well, the message that tells of Jesus and the community that models Jesus, those two things go together. One of the unexpected blessings, I suppose, of of these uh, last difficult months is that in some ways, the message about Jesus is getting wider exposure than ever. I know that there are people who are listening to the messages that come out from here and from many other places that wouldn't have been engaging with them uh, before. And, and, And that's great. And if you're listening, I'm just so delighted that you are. But in a sense, according to this, you're really only getting half the picture for what, in part, ought to persuade you of the reality of God and of his love is seeing a bunch of people who have been transformed by that love, who've been so captivated by the God who loves them that they begin to share that love with one another another, and they're united in a way that, that in a sense, can't be explained apart from the the reality of God. And we have to admit that we do a poor job of that at times. We don't show the Savior's love. We don't allow it to transform us anything like we should. But I have to say that, that I have just loved to see new people come into this church and be welcomed and drawn in, and able at least in some way to see that the Lord means the world to so many of the people here, and he is at work within them, and indeed he's at work to create unity uh, between them, between us. Well, uh, these things, both of these things, you see, are designed to make that impact. Uh, Some may first be struck by the truth and say, well, these things make sense. What does it produce? And then they see the community. Some are first uh, struck by the community, by the results. And then they say, well, what is it that makes these people like this? And, And both of those things, you see, are there in order to make impact. And Jesus wants his people to make impact on the world. And and then thirdly, Jesus wants his people to be together. This is marvelous. Verse 24, Father, he prays, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. You, You remember we pictured Jesus on the mountain looking over the horizons of the years. And we see here that he casts his eye right to the right to the end, to the final horizon, when his people are are gathered with him. And he clearly longs for that day. So, So Jesus looked forward, and if you're a believer, he prayed for you, and he looked forward and longed for the time also when he would be with you and you would be with him. It's amazing. It's, it's very much the language of love and of longing. One person sees this, it says this, Jesus in these final moments, as, he, as the last grains of sand trickle through the hourglass before his rendezvous, uh, one person says this, Jesus in these final moments, as the last grains of sand trickle through the hourglass before his rendezvous with darkness, gazes across the rolling aeons of the future and anticipates the embrace of his beloved bride in the glory that is yet to be. Some of us today perhaps feel that we are lonely or despairing or unimportant or unknown. But but listen, if you're a believer, Jesus stood at, at the other side of the cross and he couldn't wait for the time that he would be with you and you would be with him and he would be with his other brothers and sisters as well with your other brothers and sisters. One person says this, Jesus in these final moments, as the last grains of sand trickle through the hourglass before his rendezvous with darkness, gazes across the rolling aeons of the future and anticipates the embrace of his beloved bride in the glory that is yet to be. Some of us may feel today lonely or despairing, or unimportant, or or unknown. But listen, if, if you're a believer, Jesus stood at the other side of the cross, 
And he couldn't wait for the time that you and your brothers and sisters would be with him. Isn't that incredible? Some of us think that Jesus died for us grudgingly or, or uh, sparingly or, or having done all of that, he looks at us and is somehow disappointed with what he got. But no, he, he longs for his bride and he embraces the cross in order to have her. You know, we sometimes sum up the gospel message like this, that we're so bad that Jesus uh, had to die for us, but we're so loved that he was glad to die for us. And he was glad to die for us because his love for us is just so very, very great. Oh, if we only believed that, there would not be a moment of our days or our nights where we despaired because we are known by the Savior and we are longed for by the Savior and we would know that. And we should know too that we're, we're loved by the Father. We see that in verse 23 where Jesus says that, uh, that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Isn't that incredible? Jesus parallels the love that the Father has for him with the love that the Father has for us. Uh, you, you see that the, the Father and the Son together in this great salvation project, uh, they, they cherish and anticipate and treasure the gathering in of God's people and the eventual coming together of the church with her Savior. So Jesus prays, and as he does so, he shows us what is on his heart. He wants us to be united. He wants us to make an impact. He wants us to be together with him, and one day we will be. Question, of course, is, as we think about that, that final day, will you be there on that day? If you are not sure about that, then make sure by turning to your Savior. No better time to do that than today as we approach this Christmas period. No one loves you like he does. No one meets your need like he does. And if you do know that you'll be there, if you know that you're a believer, then pray that you will let it change your days as you live for him. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you that though we now pray to you, there was that time when the Lord Jesus prayed for us. It's so amazing. And we realize that his intercession for us continues. We pray that you will help us to be the people that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be. Indeed, the people that he calls us to be and the people that he died in order to make us. Hear us, Lord, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to our prayer of intercession, and sometimes we call this the, the prayer of intercession. What does that mean? Well, it means that we can speak on behalf of each other to God. We can come before Him with each other's needs and bringing our concerns before Him. And today, as we intercede for one another, as we speak to God on each other's behalf, we also need to be reminded that Jesus speaks to God on our behalf, that He speaks to the Father for us. That's part of John 17 and what is happening in the prayer. We can read that for ourselves. And a quote that helps us with this is Robert Murray McShane's quote whenever he says, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million of my enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. So it's with that knowledge that Jesus intercedes for us that we come and that we pray together interceding for one another. Let's pray. Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 14 through 16 say, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace 
to help in a time of need. Father in heaven, we take for granted that we can talk to you directly. What a privilege. What a privilege it is that you always listen, that you never tell us to come back again later, that you never say to us that you're too busy or that you've gone on holidays. Instead, you're always turning your ear to hear our faintest words. Jesus, we praise you that we can come to the very throne room of heaven with confidence and that at your feet we will find all that we need, that you have made a way for us. And Jesus, to know that you are praying for our protection, for our eternal safety, so that none of us, none of your people will be lost, what an amazing assurance that gives us. So today, we ask for those who are weary to know that you have not got fed up with them. For those mourning, to know that in grief you hold them safely. For those who have failed, to know that they are still secure. For those who are weak and unstable, to know that you, Jesus, are propping them up. For those who feel like they can't go on because of sickness, anxiety, depression, because of the pressure of school, the uncertainty of business and employment, the stress of relationships, or for, for whatever other reason that is robbing people of peace, may we all know that we will not be lost, that you will not lose us, that you are not giving up on us. May we know that we are in your hand and that your hand is in the Father's hand and that we are united to you and you came to earth to rescue your people and you will pray for us all until we are safely at home with you. So today, in the midst of coronavirus, in the midst of so much uncertainty, even if the earth beneath our feet should give way, we will not fear. For many today, it feels like everything is crumbling. People are missing their friends, missing their family, missing their routine. And although we do thank you, Lord, for this news of a vaccine that has been announced this week, help us not to see this as our Savior. May the world not be distracted by a vaccine this Christmas, but may they see the only true Savior. May they see Jesus, and may they repent and believe. Lord, you go after the sheep in danger. You pursue those who are drifting, and we thank you. We thank you that you are faithful, that you are our friend, that you are our Savior that you are the rescuer. So for our land, for our government, for our situations, for our worries, we say, Lord, through all of these things, bring glory to your name, for that is the only thing that matters. May we trust you. May we keep our eyes on you through the midst of every storm with the knowledge that one day you will lead us safely home. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his Let my soul be lost, His promises shall last, bought by Him at such a cost. grace, mercy, and peace from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>